today, banking on the banks. The DFA Daily to the 4th of May 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Just before we start, a quick reminder that tomorrow, Tuesday the 5th of May at 8pm Sydney, I'm running my next live Q&A event. You can ask a question live via the YouTube chat or beforehand via the DFA blog. And I'll also be releasing the latest mortgage stress and scenario data. So I look forward to seeing you there. The latest bank to shuffle up to its shareholders was Westpac, who announced a statutory net profit of $1.19 billion today, down 62%, and cash earnings of $993 million, down 70%, or, if you exclude notable items, $2.278 billion, down just 44%. They lifted their impairment charge to $2.238 trillion, up $1.905 billion, including potential impacts of COVID-19. So cash earnings per share came out at 28 cents, down 71%, or, again, excluding notable items, 64 cents, down a mere 46%. Their net interest margin was 2.13%, up one basis point, but management expects more margin pressure ahead. And their return on equity was 2.9% or, excluding notable items, 6.7%, while their CET1 ratio was 10.8%. They deferred the interim dividend decision for now. And the media release was full on. Westpac remains well provisioned and capitalised. Nevertheless, the board recognises the uncertain economic and operating conditions and how these may develop over the next six months. The board also accepted APRA's consistent guidance on dividends and being prudent at this point in time. Westpac has kept APRA informed about its stress testing scenarios and capital position. Westpac has not received any concerns from APRA on the bank's capital position. The board will continue to review dividend options over the course of this year. Westpac will continue to assess opportunities to improve capital utilisation across the group. And the strategic review of its specialist businesses will also consider further ways to optimise capital. The group's funding and liquidity were strengthened over the half as customer deposits grew faster than loans. The liquidity coverage ratio, the LCR, and net stable funding ratio, the NSFR, also increased, including the allocation of $18 billion from the Reserve Bank's term funding facility. The LCR ended at 154% and the NSFR at 117%. Net interest margins were well managed over the half, ending at 2.13%. And Westpac's group CEO, Mr King, said, This is the most difficult result Westpac has seen in many years. It is significantly impacted by high impairment charges due to COVID-19, as well as notable items including the Austrac provision. Westpac's balance sheet remains strong. Customer deposits were up $19 billion over the half, more than funding loan growth, which increased by $5 billion. And the deposit-to-loan ratio is now over 75%. So we are well capitalised and our liquidity and funding metrics are comfortably above regulatory requirements. In the light of the changed economic outlook, we have increased Westpac's provisions for expected credit losses to $5.8 billion, which includes approximately $1.6 billion in additional impairment charges predominantly related to COVID-19 impacts. Westpac has also provisioned $900 million for a potential penalty relating to the Austrac civil proceedings brought against it on the 20th of November 2019. Mr King said it was clear that Westpac's non-financial risk management needed to improve and this was one of the group's highest priorities. So no surprise then that mortgage underwriting standards are being tightened again following recent relaxations. For example, at Westpac, which includes subsidiaries the Bank of Melbourne, 
Bank SA and St George Bank announced changes to its consumer credit policy effective Thursday the 30th of April. The revisions include the withdrawal of lenders' mortgage insurance waivers and the tightening of income verification requirements for new lending. Westpac informed brokers that its LMI waiver offering, available for loans with an LVR of up to 90%, has been withdrawn for the industry specialisation sectors and the sports and entertainment sector. Moreover, the threshold for LMI fee waivers for qualifying medical professionals has been reduced from a maximum LVR of 90% to a maximum LVR of 85%. And Westpac has also announced that it will now require borrowers to provide more recent proof of income for their serviceability assessment. For loans submitted before the 30th of April, the latest payslip or alternative documentation for proof of income must be no more than two weeks old or one month for monthly pay cycles. Applicants who are unable to provide the latest proof of income due to self-isolation are required to provide supplementary evidence, for example salary credits, that matches the profile of older pay slips. According to Westpac, these latest credit policy changes were made to ensure the bank is lending responsibly in the current environment, adding that they reflect recent changes in the global and domestic economic outlook as a result of the pandemic. We remain committed to helping our customers purchase the next property, and these changes will help us to continue to do this in a responsible and sustainable way, Westpac told brokers. In fact, Westpac is the latest among several lenders, including NAB, Bank West, ING, Gateway Bank, My State Bank, Heritage Bank, ME Bank, and a number of non banks to tighten serviceability standards for new lending amid forecasts of a spike in defaults. Though we also hear on the grapevine that some banks are willing to accept income from government support packages as part of a mortgage affordability assessment. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. A non-major lender, Teachers Mutual Bank, also announced that it would no longer issue credit for off-the-plan property purchases and has tightened its serviceability assessment policy as part of its response to credit quality concerns arising from COVID-19. The changes include reducing the threshold for commissions and bonuses income from an average of 80% over two years to an average of 50%, reducing the threshold for acceptable regular overtime income, excluding essential services, from 80% to 70%, reducing the threshold for residential rental income from 70% to 60%, and reducing the threshold for commercial rental income from 60% to 50%, and reducing the threshold for investment income including interest and dividends, for an average of 80% over the past two years to 50%. The revisions are effective for all new applications from the 1st of May across all its brands, which include Firefighters Mutual, Health Professionals Bank and Unibank. The bank said these changes have been made to promote the sustainability of our book throughout this crisis. All of our four divisions have a solid volume of loans coming in at present and we want to continue to encourage loan applications with strong credit quality. As always, we will continue to monitor the situation and consider all environmental factors when reviewing our policy. But competition for what business there is is driving rates lower, with a new record low variable rate of 2.29% now on offer. Since the 1st of April, more than 50 lenders have cut at least one variable rate for new customers, and nearly 60 lenders have cut at least one of their fixed rates, with the lowest of the market resting at 2.09%. The cash rate might have settled in at 0.25%, but competition between the lenders has continued to put downward pressure on home loan rates, with fixed rates at record lows of just 2.09%, while the lowest variable rate is now 2.29%. But all this begs the question, how good are our banks? Well, the ABC's Ian Verinder penned this piece. If you believe the myths, Australia's financial system is the envy of the developed world. We skipped through the global financial crisis with barely hiccup. Unlike other banks, ours required little, if any, assistance. It's a terrific tale of Australian exceptionalism, except it's not true. During the crisis a decade ago, the federal government underwrote loans to our banks to the tune of $120 billion. Essentially, taxpayers borrowed cash from offshore. 
so the banks could roll over their loan commitments and continue operations. That's not all. There were bans on short selling to help arrest the slide in financial stocks. And taxpayers guaranteed bank deposit up to half a million dollars. And then there were the rescues all behind closed doors. Westpac kindly mopped up St George. The Commonwealth Bank took over the beleaguered Bank West as its UK parent teetered. National Australia Bank was preparing a move on Trouble Suncorp that was scuppered by the federal government's loan underwriting. And the State Bank of Victoria was absorbed by CBA back in 1990 after it imploded in the wake of a series of scandals that saw a senior executive charged with criminal offences. South Australia's State Bank collapsed around the same time. Both were involved in high-risk lending through the boom years of the 1980s. But it was ANZ and Westpac that nearly collapsed the entire system back then. Westpac had loaded up on commercial property loans in the wake of the 1987 stock market crash. When interest rates spiked at 18%, the property market tanked and Westpac's $5 billion in bad debts almost wiped out its $6.7 billion in equity. ANZ was in a similarly precarious position and the then Prime Minister Paul Keating was under immense pressure to allow the big four to become the big two. Banking is the riskiest business of all. Huge amounts of debt are covered by skinny amounts of equity. As the interface between borrowers and lenders, banks are vitally important to the health of the economy. That's why governments ride to the rescue at the first hint of trouble. It's why the Reserve Bank acts as lender of last resort. And it's also why, having scraped through the near collapse of Western capitalism a decade ago, Governments worldwide insisted banks beef up their finances to ensure they could cover another meltdown. This time, the crisis hasn't started in the finance sector. It's been forced upon us by a virus that has shut down productive activity. But the longer this goes on, the more pressure builds on the weak points in the financial system. Australia's banks have indeed beefed up their finances during the past decade in a bid to make them unquestionably strong. But they were dragged kicking and screaming all the way because every extra dollar put into reserves hurts their profits and executive bonuses. And while they've been socking away those reserves, for much of the past decade, they've simultaneously declared that as our economy is strong, their loans are safe and they don't need as much cash to cover bad and doubtful debts. From 2010 until last year, each of the banks chipped away at the amount of cash that they'd put away to cover bad debts. As they released that cash, it turbocharged profits. Unfortunately, the opposite is now occurring. They've bet the office as well as the house, in fact, in the aftermath of the 1987 market crash and the recession of the early 1990s, the big four opted to play it safe. Hobnobbing with flashy entrepreneurs was out. Instead, they each targeted real estate and particularly home loans. It was dull, but hugely profitable. And the end result, well, Australia. And the end result, well, Australia has some of the world's most expensive residential real estate and household debt at an eye-watering 200% of income. As most bankers have been keen to point out, that's not a problem so long as unemployment remains low, as most people will do almost anything to keep a roof over their heads. As job losses continue to rise because of shutdowns, the number of Australians struggling to repay their mortgages is expected to lift to higher levels than seen during the global financial crisis. And unfortunately, unemployment is about to hit double digits. Investment bank Goldman Sachs estimates that without the blurring of data as a result of the Job Seeker program, our jobless rate could hit 19.2%. That will put enormous strains on the residential property market as homeowners default on loans. And that's not the only problem. In addition to residential property, our banks also plugged into commercial property, funding high-rise developments, office towers and retail. Westpac's Mr King last week hinted at concerns of a potential downturn in commercial real estate. As Macquarie highlights, both NAB and ANZ are much more exposed to commercial real estate than industries such as hospitality and travel, which were obvious early casualties of social distancing and the partial lockdowns. 
NAB has around $74 billion in exposure to commercial real estate, and with corporations laying out vast numbers of workers and unemployment likely to remain elevated until well into next year, office valuations could drop sharply. This could become a long-term trend, particularly if more workers operate from home in future. There is a strong relationship between unemployment and office vacancy rates, as this chart from the investment bank Morgan Stanley demonstrates. Check out the spike in unemployment during the last recession in 1992 and look at the impact it had on Sydney office vacancies. The building owners were left with acres of empty space that forced them to write down the value of their investments. Many went broke. The banks were left nursing massive losses. The government was put under extreme pressure and investors lost heavily. Well, could it happen again? He says, you can bank on it. And today, APRA published its first industry-level data relating to benefits paid to members through the government's COVID-19 temporary early release of superannuation scheme. Under APRA's early release initiative, the ERI, data collection, superannuation trustees were asked to submit data on a weekly basis covering the number and value of early release benefits paid to superannuation members and the processing times for those payments. Data was submitted to APRA on the 29th of April for the week ending the 26th of April. All 167 funds that APRA requested data from regarding early release payments provided it to APRA. Although not all funds had received applications from the Australian Tax Office or paid benefits to members during the week. Today's initial ERI publication shows that in the first week of the scheme, superannuation trustees received 665,310 applications for early release, processed 162,879 applications and paid members $1.3 billion. The average benefit paid was $8,002. For applications paid in the first week of the scheme, trustees took an average of 1.6 days to make payments to eligible members after receipt of their applications from the ATO. Given this was the first week of the early release initiative, trustees had no applications that were more than five business days old. APRA Deputy Chair Helen Rowell said this new data collection enables APRA, government and other stakeholders to monitor the take-up of the new scheme and ensure trustees are processing eligible applications in a timely manner. Although this publication only covers the first week of a scheme that will run for several months, the initial data indicates trustees are moving quickly to make payments after receiving determinations from the ATO. Under the Superannuation Industry Supervision Act 1993, trustees are legally required to make early release payments to eligible members as soon as practical. We expect trustees should generally be able to achieve this within five business days. However, we recognise that this may not be practical in all cases, as trustees conduct fraud checks and fulfil their legal obligation to look out for the best interests of all fund members. APRA is closely monitoring trustee performance in this area and will consider taking appropriate action if evidence emerges of funds not releasing benefits to eligible members as soon as practicable. APRA intends to publish updated data every Monday and will expand the publication next week to include fund level data. And the Australian Bureau of Statistics today released its monthly building approval data covering all states and territories up till March. Due to the lag between purchasing a dwelling and getting a building approval, these results are from sales prior to the restrictions on trade and travel. So building approvals rose 1.8% in the March quarter 2020 compared to the previous quarter. And this suggests that before the virus, the housing market was gaining at least some momentum. Approvals were steady across the board with both detached houses and multi-unit experiencing quarterly increases of 1.9% and 1.5% respectively. New South Wales had the strongest month for multi-unit approvals since February 2019 to make the March quarter 28.6% higher than the December 2019 quarter. In seasonally adjusted terms, building approvals for March 2020 quarter increased in New South Wales up 16.5% and Tasmania up 6.1% 
while remaining flat in Western Australia down 1.8%, Victoria down 1.7% and Queensland down 0.8%. And approvals declined in South Australia down 19.1% in trend terms. The Northern Territory was flat and the ACT declined by 4.9%. But as I've warned before, these are very noisy data series and so we shouldn't take this too seriously. But we did get more on how businesses are being impacted by COVID from the ABS too. They said that 7 in 10 businesses reported that reduced cash flow and reduced demand for goods and services are expected to have an adverse impact over the next two months. This compares to two-thirds of businesses reporting reduced demand for goods and services and reduced cash flow or turnover in the March business impacts of COVID-19 survey previously. Two of in five businesses reported that they expect uncertain financial markets as a result of COVID-19 to have an adverse impact on businesses in the next two months. And several businesses commented that this uncertainty was specifically related to the value of the Australian dollar and commodity prices. More than half of all businesses in the wholesale trade at 66% or retail trade at 59% and manufacturing at 59% reported that supply chain uncertainty was expected to have an adverse impact on business. Several businesses commented on expected logistical issues due to the interstate travel restrictions and border closures. And government restrictions such as social distancing measures have had a significant impact on the operating environment for businesses in accommodation and food services. In the March business impacts of COVID-19 survey, 9 out of 10 businesses in accommodation and food services reported that government restrictions had had an adverse impact on operations. Businesses in this industry are anticipating that these restrictions will continue to have an impact in the next two months. And more than two in five businesses, 44%, reported that the announcement of the JobKeeper payment scheme influenced their decision to continue to employ staff. A greater proportion of small businesses, 0 to 19 persons, and medium businesses, 20 to 199 persons, both at 45%, compared to large businesses at 200 or more persons employed at 32%, reported that the JobKeeper payment scheme influenced their decision to continue to employ staff. Businesses in the combination food services were the most likely to report the JobKeeper payment scheme having influenced their employment decisions at 67%. And three in five businesses, or 61%, reported having registered or intending to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme. By business size, 61% of small, 6% of medium and 45% of large businesses reported having registered or intending to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme. The area of each segment in the diagram shows the relative share of each industry division of total jobs. And the figures within the segments represent the proportion of businesses in each industry that have registered or intend to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme. And four in five businesses in the construction industry have registered or intend to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme. This industry represents 8% of total jobs in the economy. By contrast, while the healthcare and social assistance industry has the highest share of total jobs in the Australian economy, at 13% of total jobs, less than half of all businesses in this industry reported having registered or even intending to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme. Of those businesses that did not intend to register for the JobKeeper scheme, 33% of all businesses, the most common reason reported was that the business did not meet the eligibility requirements, 55%, and large businesses were most likely to report not meeting the eligibility requirements at 81%. By business size, small businesses were most likely to report insufficient cash flow at 8%, as a reason for not intending to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme. By industry, those businesses that did not intend to register for the JobKeeper payment scheme included businesses in education and training at 97% were the most likely to report that the business does not meet the eligibility criteria. Three in five businesses in arts and recreation services at 58% reported that none of their employees meet the eligibility of a criteria. And a quarter of businesses in education and training and information media and telecommunications, about 24%, reported that they do not have sufficient cash flow 
to continue paying staff before JobKeeper payments commence, and difficulty in understanding the eligibility criteria was the most likely to be reported by businesses in other services, 19%, and accommodation and food services, 19%. 44% expected all of their employees to be eligible for the scheme. 29% expected more than half of their employees to be eligible for the scheme. And 21% accepted less than half of their employees to be eligible for the scheme. So that tells me that while the schemes have some benefit, there are a considerable number of businesses that are unable or are unwilling to access the scheme. And one of the main barriers is the cash flow barrier. They have to pay money out well before they receive any money from the government. And certainly information from my SME surveys confirm this too. It is by far one of the biggest barriers. So standing back, it's clear to me that the broader economic implications of COVID are now really starting to bite. And because of the fact that many businesses that are still trading are needing to borrow more from the bank, and the banks themselves are now under pressure too, it seems to me that we've got to ask some pretty hard questions about the robustness and viability of our banks. But the good news, of course, is that if history is any guide, then the government will support them and support them to the hilt because they know that banks are too important to fall over. And international investors know that the banks in Australia are as good as the government, which may put a flaw under their share price. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thank you.